Last time on the Columbia Basin Agate Story. I've spent a lot of time here discussing the origin of CBAs, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. And what's really important is that we enjoy the hunt for these elusive agates. Enjoyment time is over. Now, we science. Jason and I made some pretty bold claims during part one. Neither of us think the agates are from northern Montana. Both of us think they came down from the ancestral Salmon Clearwater River during Ringgold time between three and nine million years ago. Now, whether they came from central or southern Idaho is less certain, as during this time the Snake River and therefore southern Idaho was cut off from the Salmon Clearwater. One of Jason's compelling points was how similar many of his agates were that he would find in his southern Idaho claims, and how the river tumbled agates he found in Lewiston were very similar to those we find in the Tri-Cities, apart from the staining. But these are all subjective observations. This looks like that. I think this river makes more sense than that river. I knew even before making part one that it wouldn't be a settled problem, and that's okay. But how about we move away from qualitative observations and move into the quantum realm? I mean quantitative realm. We still may not get a conclusive answer at the end of it, but damn it, I want to do some science. And for me, that means geochemistry. That's the part I really like about it is you can argue your opinion with my opinion, but it's hard to argue science. It's it, it's emotionless data. It has no no horse in the race, so to speak. It just tells you the facts of here's what it registered. I briefly contemplated investigating the composition of the agates. Maybe there's some key element in there that could set the CBAs apart from other agates or point back toward a source. It's not a totally wild hypothesis, because you see there are these agates from central Washington called Ellensburg Blues. The high quality stuff is very blue and very valuable in part because they're so rare. But they aren't the only blue chalcedony to be found in the region or elsewhere in the world for that matter. So a growing number of people were curious about whether the blue stones in their jewelry or that cool stone they found in the Yakima River were actually Ellensburg blues. The problem is, how do you define it? You can't rely on qualitative observations like color because that's subjective and variable. Not all blues are the same blue. This is just a tangent, so I'll keep it short, but the punchline is that people like Dr. Angela Halfpenny from Central Washington University analyzed a bunch of Ellensburg blue agates from Ellensburg and elsewhere and found that true Ellensburg blues had higher concentrations of zirconium. We've tested blue agates from uh, Turkish blues, uh, African chalcedony, African blue lace, red top blues, Yanaway, grays, Mojave blues, Holly blues, Walker Valley blues, Swift Creek, Baker Lake area as well. The threshold that I consider for Ellensburg to make it tell me, to have that machine tell me it's an Ellensburg blue is about double what you find in most of the other blue agates. But here's the problem with applying this to CBAs. All Ellensburg blues are blue to a varying extent, but still blue. But CBAs run the gamut of color and appearance from waterline to fortified and tubes, and there's even some amethyst in there, as we saw. I was doubtful there would be one single element that could define the whole group. Another problem is that we don't have the source material to compare it against. With Ellensburg Blues, we have many samples with known histories or that were collected on site in Ellensburg. We can't go out and collect the source agates of CBAs because that's what we're trying to figure out. And we would need lots and lots of agates to compare against to find the one or maybe two key compositional indicators. Now, I'm not well versed in agate chemistry, but I do know basalts. And it turns out that, like most agates, the matrix for CBAs is basalt. Remember, I'm not talking about where CBAs are found today in the reworked flood deposits or poorly consolidated old river channels. I'm talking about the rock that the agates originally crystallized in. My reasoning goes like this. Think about Thunder Eggs, the state rock of Oregon. To keep it simple, these are a highly variable assortment of chalcedony or opal that fill voids in rhyolite. Some of them have a unique look, and a trained eye can usually spot, say, a Richardson's Ranch Thunder Egg. But the thing is, within a few miles, or sometimes a few tens of meters, the look of Thunder Eggs can change dramatically. A mossy agate bed can be a stone's throw from a water line. Now think about what would happen if these were river tumbled, wearing away the rhyolite matrix, and deposited right next to each other. You'd think they formed in totally different areas. Now it might be the same story with CBAs. There's endless variety, even within a mile stretch at Fur Road, but perhaps many of these formed close to one another. And if we could only find some CBAs with basalt matrix, maybe we could analyze those to identify a source region. If only I had some samples. I had a blind spot with regard to researching the pieces that I had with Matrix 
to try to source where those agates have come from. And that is an obvious and very logical process that somebody might follow. I can't believe I didn't think of it. <laughs> so thank you for introducing that idea into my very busy brain. I have lots and if you need half a dozen to make it statistically valid, I'll give you half a dozen. I don't care, like I have plenty. This is definitely worthwhile in terms of, I would have no problems giving you what you need to do that. So I'll just leave it at that. Looking at basalts might also make my job easier because they're so widely studied. Every continent and ocean on Earth has basalts, and they're generally well studied because they give geologists information about interior Earth processes, geodynamics, volcanisms, and sometimes just make people go, hmm, I wonder how that formed. As a result, there's lots of published basalt geochemistry out there. But before I go diving into the literature, I figured I should make some preliminary analyses because this may not be a cut and dry process. So this should give us the uh, elemental sequence and accompanying ratios, which means how much of each element. And it should give them in the order that they appear as far as their uh, amount. It is a field portable model. The area to place samples is uh, pretty limited, about yay big. And we get, you know, big rocks brought in. What is this? What's inside of it, you know? So it is nice to be able to just pop it out of the stand. XRF technology is becoming much more popular nowadays. I notice a lot of jewelry stores have it for uh, precious metals. So you can put on a, a ring uh, on the thing and sample it. And if you have the precious metals program, it'll tell you exactly what carat it is. It'll, it'll also give you the raw data, uh, this much percentage of gold, this much of this, and the other alloys that they mix in. But it also, being the precious metals program, it will say it's sterling or it's 14 karat gold, we'll say. Where uh, the geochem program that we use, which is what you need for, for rocks, uh, it just, it doesn't say what kind of rock it is. It just gives you raw data. The Bruker Titan is a portable XRF or X-ray fluorescence instrument. An electron emitter hits a source metal of some kind, which produces specific energies of X-rays. Those X-rays are then directed at a sample. A spectrum of X-rays are released depending on what's inside that sample because elements have characteristic X-ray energies, and a detector then records those energies as something like counts per second. The energy relates to their atomic structure and electron orbits and stuff, but the basic science is that the incident X-rays excite inner orbital electrons in an element, and those electrons get excited, and when higher shell electrons move in to fill the void space, that releases energy. There's lots of ways to discuss this at varying levels of expertise, so I'll just link to the Bruker website as a broad overview if you want to learn more. So anyway, you analyze your sample for however long it takes to obtain what's called an energy spectrum. Shown here are two spectra, one for a type of olivine known as phaolite, and one for calcite. They have clearly distinct energy peaks reflecting their different compositions. Now these are for minerals, but the idea is the same for analyzing anything from bulk rock to paint to the silver of a ring. One of the great things about XRF is that, with few exceptions, it's non-destructive. So you can take lots of analyses of a sample, time and time again, without damaging it. That's really key for this testing, is lots of tests and really kind of seeing, you know, where the bell curve's hitting and making sure that, you know, you have enough tests that you're getting a very high, very accurate bell curve. Um, because, like you saw, just in that one rock, we had different readings. But between these two rocks, we had very similar readings, which was kind of cool. And I can do the third one and see how close it's going to read. You can kind of see where you're hitting on the rock. So sometimes if we need to make sure that the placement's just right, like we're missing between bands or something, we can move this around just enough to make sure we're not like in one of those voids there or on one of the bands that's a different color than what we want to test. So it gives it a little bit more fine tuning, um, but we know we've hit and miss on even using this. We can miss the spots. You had uh, SiO2 at? 42%. 42. Aluminum at 6%, potassium at 3.7. Iron oxide at 2.8, calcium oxide at 0.66, and then as we get lower, they're trace elements, and so they don't have as much to do with the, the makeup of the, the material, but they give hints of what they've been touching as they've formed. 
if a table of numbers and abbreviations makes your eyes glaze over, don't worry, we're not going to get too far into the weeds yet. Let's pull up the periodic table to make me sound smarter. Generally, an element is a major element if it makes up more than 0.1% of the compound. Trace elements are less than 0.1%. Ignore the fact that barium is 0.3 here, we're still lumping it in with the trace elements. It should all add up to about 100%. Sharp-eyed viewers may notice that this doesn't. 71%. Um, you know that there's still some elements that are missing, um, and those are going to be your lighter ones. So lighter than so it's our magnesium, so lighter than sodium, neon, fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, boron, beryllium, and lithium. Helium and hydrogen, we usually kind of throw those out just because, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so if we get something that has a light reading like these would, then we kind of look at it again going, could it be lithium? Could it be beryllium? Could it be carbon? Um, and with gemstones, it's easier to do with basalt probably a mixture of all of them, I would think. So I was doing too much during this session, honestly, with recording, interviewing, and trying to capture XRF results simultaneously to really think about the analyses in as much detail as I should have. The 42% SiO2 was vaguely basaltish, but I didn't think deeply enough about the low totals. And because I guess I'd make a terrible geologist, I also really didn't notice the lack of magnesium. For a brief moment while looking at the numbers later, I thought I just wasted two hours of the Langford's time, but after doing some research, I think not all is lost. It looks like portable XRF has some issues with the lighter elements, magnesium, sodium, aluminum. Uh, they can be quantified, but need a longer analysis time, and don't always work well for the rough, unprepared samples like the ones I brought in. But it seems decent for potential trace elements of interest, like zirconium, niobium, yttrium, and others. For every analytical method, there's a balance between sample preparation and analytical resolution and precision. XRF has one of the lower limits of resolution and higher sample volumes, but it is also one of the few on this chart where you can pop a sample on it and start zapping away without damaging your grandma's Ellensburg blue or your prized meteorite that's not actually a meteorite, trust me. Get another spot on this and kind of see an average. And then we'll let you do all the hard work of putting all that data together. <laughs> It's interesting how some of these elements can make a big difference with just a little bit of a change and others don't make much of a difference. It's like getting a feel for your XRF. You start to get a feel for it, like, ah, oh, I bet this is going to be high in iron because I see that rust. Or you'd want to be aware of what that red was before you, you know, like uh, Jared says, don't lick rocks. From currently rock hounding, I put one of his stickers on the XRF because it is nowhere more fitting than on the XRF. So, yeah, some of this has just been as we've played with other places, you know, like the gemstones or with other materials, kind of guessing what it could be or using Google a lot to say, okay, what am I missing? What I'm not seeing in this jade or in this topaz, but um, kind of getting a little bit better handle on what it looks like and what it might test out as. So. These are very expensive machine. In fact, to rent one is uh, $500 a day we charge a small fee, $20. We're getting the capability to where we can print you off a print. The way the university was doing it is they didn't give you the elements or the what you're seeing here. What they would do for the blues was they were attempting to determine the source location. So it would either be Ellensburg blue or, or not Ellensburg blue. Um, and so that, that's okay, but I, I like the, the numbers and stuff. It gives you a, a better sense, I feel, of what you're actually looking at instead of just a graph that says, yes, it's Ellensburg. If you have an interesting rock and like to have it tested, you know, bring it down. Um, we may not have the answers, but we'll be able to work with you to figure out the answers. And thank goodness for Google and people have gone to school for this. They can help us figure it out too. It's opened up a whole new world of exploration as far as what makes up the core of this stone or gemstone or whatnot. I mean, you're seeing right into the very essence of it, down to its elemental sequence. You know, you can't break it down any finer than an element. And this will tell you, here's all of them that are in it that we can detect. Pretty neat, pretty high tech, space age, all that. For this project, Jason loaned me several CBAs with attached host matrix. Three are from the Tri-Cities area and exhibit the characteristic yellowish staining. 
Three are from the Lewiston area, and he also sent a few pieces of basalt from one of his Idaho claims. These agates are all wicked cool, and I thought we should just take a moment to appreciate their beauty. Okay, smashy smashy time, next episode. <laughs>